to be your moderator for this panel. Uh, this um, panel is called uh, Oregon's Tribal History, uh, Racism, the Pandemic, and Our Future. And um, we also have Sasha Bartu smith is with us, and she's our panel technical support, who's done just a fantastic job of organizing this event. And uh, Sasha is also the Community Advocacy Support Specialist at NEA. Uh, before we begin, I just want to give a, a great big hearty thank you to the conference hosts, uh, the Jewish Federation of Greater Portland. Uh, we couldn't have uh, pulled this conference off without all their great support. So uh, we have a wonderful group of uh, panelists, which I'll introduce in a little bit. But before we get started, I wanted to let you know uh, that you can submit questions through the conference um, the uh, app Hoova, and I do believe that you can also submit questions and comments through this, uh, the Zoom chat room. So um, I mentioned that we have uh, some wonderful tribal leaders on our panel, uh, three of them from the Portland community, all great friends uh, of mine and great friends of Indian country. Uh, we'll first hear from my good friend, Danny Ledesma. Danny's tribal affiliation is Apache and Hickoria and is currently the Senior Advisor on Racial Equity and Social Justice at Portland Public Schools. Danny has an amazing history of supporting communities of color and has been a great advocate for the Native community in the Portland area. Then we're going to hear from Jolene Joseph. Uh, Jolene is a tribal member of the, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Ani, mm -hmm. uh, people, of, um, people and is the Executive Director of the Native Wellness Institute uh, with its mission of promoting the well being of Native people through programs and trainings that embrace the teachings and traditions of our ancestors. For the past 35 years, she has traveled throughout North America, providing wellness and healing, training and technical assistance to tribes, uh, First Nations, Aboriginal organizations, and in a variety of areas such as youth development, leadership, healthy relationships, uh, wellness in the workplace, and much more. Finally, we'll hear from uh, Natalyn Begay. Natalyn is a citizen of the Dene Nation and works at the Native American Youth and Family Center as the Health Equity Program Manager. Uh, Natalyn has been a leader and protector of the Native community in the Portland area with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. She has uh, guided approaches that, to the pandemic that has, uh, in no doubt, uh, saved many lives. So um, we'll, hear, uh, we'll first hear from Danny. So why don't you take it away, Danny? Hi, Paul, uh, and thank you very much. I'm really honored and delighted to be able to be on this panel uh, with Paul and with Jalene and with Natalyn. Uh, I really uh, respect everyone that's on here. And I'm excited about the opportunity to talk about um, our tribal history as well as our tribal future uh, here in Oregon. Um, before I begin, I'd like to let folks know I'm gonna focus a little bit more on education, um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the history. Um, the Portland metro region uh, rests on the traditional lands of the bands of the Chinook, the Multnomah, the Clackamas, the Tualatin, the Malala, the Kalapuyo, the Wasco, the Cowlitz, and the Kathlamet tribes. These tribes established their communities in a really resource-rich area where they traded and fished along the rivers and harvested those natural resources that fed and maintained their families. And this is home. Upon European contact, our federal policy in the United States was to eliminate tribal people and much later to assimilate us in an attempt to erase the rich tribal traditions that sustain us. In the 1950s, under federal relocation policy, a large segment of the native population in the U.S. was forced to relocate to several major cities of which Portland was one. This has added to the diversity of the tribal representation in the region. During the same era under the Oregon Termination Act and the Klamath Termination Act, many of Oregon's tribes' governments were abolished and tribal lands taken away only to be partially reinstated over 20 years later. Yet many of those terminated tribes in Oregon still are not reinstated. The federal boarding school era, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, that went well into the 1960s attempted assimilation through removal of children from their families and punished who and those children were punished severely in order to quote kill the Indian and save the man. This was federal policy. 
None of these policies could be challenged through the electoral process because Oregon restricted Native Americans from voting until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Today, we know that Portland's Metro Native community is diverse and growing. The population is estimated to be nearly 80,000. Traditional data sources such as the census or the American Community Survey often undercount Native people for several reasons. Fear and mistrust of federal government is the primary reason many do not participate nor disclose their heritage in the census. Another difficulty is because of the history of genocide and assimilation, many Native community members identify as biracial or multiracial, and many institutions only take into account Native American alone when classifying the Native community. This is definitely true in the education institutions. While many community members strongly identify as Native, we know that there are community members who are disconnected and hesitate to identify as Native. The community discussion uh, groups that happen throughout our community are really a, a, a continuing opportunity to discussions like today are a continuing opportunity to understand the history, but also to think about how we can think of a brighter future, a better future that is self-determined by our, by our tribal community members. I wanna talk a little bit about education. Um, as we talked about, Portland metro area was um, established with many vibrant traditional communities. And these tribal traditions were passed along through family members, through community, trade, fishing, natural resources, arts, cultural traditions. These were all very important and reinforced indigenous ways of knowing. Unfortunately, as part of termination, as part of assimilation and federal policy, these traditional ways of knowing were really uh, compromised through the boarding school policy and through Indian education. S children were forcibly removed from their families and sent to boarding schools. And in Oregon, we have the second longest running boarding school on the West Coast that was established in 1805. At these boarding schools, students were severely punished for speaking their language, for displaying and uh, speaking to their cultural traditions. Not only were they severely punished, but their, their hair were, was cut, their traditions were removed, and they were really forced to think about how they assimilate to quote, what was American society. All of our education, our American education system has really been fo focused on assimilation and the removal of native culture, native traditions in the American schooling system. So when we think about students, our native students here in Portland that attend Portland Public Schools, uh, they encounter several myths. And I'd like to talk a little bit about some of those myths because a lot of that has to do with the legacy of termination, of genocide, and of assimilation. One of the most pernicious myths and one of the most dangerous myths that we see in American public education today is that there is often the assumption that there are no Native students that attend public schools. Or if there are students who attend public schools, the numbers are so small that they're statistically insignificant. And that is something that reinforces that terrible history of termination, that terrible history of erasure. Um, and we often see that students are not counted, are not as their needs are not taken into account. And so at Portland Public Schools, one of the things that we're really proud of is that our theory of action is based on centering our work for improving the school district on the lives of Native students, of naming the fact that because of this myth of invisibility, that it's important that we recognize that our Native students are here um, that they're very diverse, that they draw upon the traditions of Oregon tribes, as well as the diversity of tribes from all over the country. Another myth, myth that we have is that the students who are, the people who are Native people all live on a reservation and therefore their needs should be taken care of by tribes. And that's not true. In Portland, we have one of the country's eighth largest urban Indian populations. And while it's true, we have a very thriving 
uh, tribal uh, tribal communities here. We have 12 federally recognized tribes here in Oregon. And many of our students, uh, families, and elders live on the reservation. But many of our students also live in urban areas. And it's important that as a public institution, we're really aware of the importance of meeting the needs of those students. Another myth that is often used as a way to not meet the needs of students is to point to the responsibility of tribes. Uh, that tribes and that Native students have an automatic free scholarship to any college that they want. Um, and public institutions and policy has often used that as a way to not necessarily invest in Native communities and to, um, and to, to, to really sort of walk away from the responsibility of ensuring that there's multiple ways for students to be able to attend college or career that reinforce Indigenous ways of knowing that reinforce uh, their abilities to live and thrive in their own communities. Um, a lot of times, a lot because of the cultural narratives, another myth that uh, students encounter in uh, the public school system and in American education is that if an American, if a if a Native student doesn't look or act stereotypically, if they don't have long hair that are in braids, if they're not wearing regalia, they're not riding a horse, uh, that they somehow are not Indian, that they are not part of a tribal community. Um, and what one of the things that we have to recognize, especially here in Portland, is that our tribal communities are very diverse. This uh, panel alone is proof of the fact that we all come from very different, uh, different tribes, different parts of the country. Uh, and that diversity is incredibly rich, uh, each with unique cultural and tribal traditions. Um, and so we have to really honor and respect and understand that our Native students and their families are bringing that diversity. Uh, not only that, but we have to push away from those, uh, those stereotypes of Native people. Uh, not allowing for the diversity is really, is really um, is really damaging to, to Native students, especially young people who are developing their identity. And we wanna make sure that their cultural identity is, is, is affirmed. Um, I think one of the most difficult myths that is happening in, uh, in, in public education now is that we live in pioneer country and there's a romanticism of pioneers. Um, many students who are my age remember playing the Oregon Trail game uh, where there were many damaging stereotypes and false narratives about tribal people and their interaction with uh, European and with, uh, with, quote, pioneers. In fact, our tribal people were victims, were, uh, were sort of forced to, uh, to relocate, were... Um, we're, we're attempted to be erased from our country. And so we really have to, in curriculum, in instruction, make sure that we're telling the full picture of American history, of the tribal history, and that we're not only talking about the terrible things that have happened to our tribal people, but that we're also ta talking about the rich assets, the ways of knowing, the cultural traditions, and that that is part of, of culture. And so I'm really proud to live in a state where a group of tribal leaders um, helped to pass Senate Bill 13, which ensures that every student in Oregon schools has to go through tribal history um, courses, and that there is that this is part of a core curriculum, uh, and that students have to understand the history, the, the tr not only the history, and the assets of uh, what has happened before, but of now, of our Oregon Indian country. And so that's really, really important uh, that we continue to push back against those, those damaging stereotypes and oversimplification of our history so that we can better understand what's happening today and the needs of our students so that they can really thrive. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over. I think there's a lot of, uh, 
importance in understanding what where some of those myths are coming from. But I also want to talk about the amazing leaders that we have in our community. Um, and so as we talk about uh, in the panel moving forward, I really am excited about the opportunity to share about some of the wonderful work that the NAIA Family Center is doing, the Many Nations Academy. We have so many wonderful, brilliant education leaders in our state. Uh, folks like Angie Morell, uh, who works for our Indian Education uh, Department in uh, Portland Public Schools, folks like Lorna Fast Buffalo Horse, Karina Wolf, folks who are really doing amazing things. Uh, we have an administrator, a principal, Melissa Schachner, um, all really uh, bringing to life the important educational uh, traditions as well as uh, really trying to move education forward for our Native students given given the history and some of the myths that they encounter in our public school system. So I'll turn it over to uh, back to Paul uh, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Danny. That was amazing. Um, next, we're going to hear from Jolene Joseph from the Native Wellness Institute. Jolene. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Danny. That was that was really amazing. And my mind is like um, going all over the place with <laughs> my thoughts um, on all of that. So um, as Paul said, my name is Jolene and um, my people, Ba'ani, is what we call ourselves in our, and it's my in my tribal language. And today I'm speaking my colonizer's language, so you can all understand me. And because I'm not a, a fluent language speaker, but I'm but I'm um, remembering my my language. And in my language, Aani means um, white clay or Aani Nin for white clay people. And that comes from our creation stories. And what the federal government calls us is Grovant, which is actually a French word because our first contact was with the French. And um, I also am remembering um, one of my old languages, which is sign language. And when our tribal people traveled and traded, we all, we all spoke sign language because we didn't speak the same language. And we had a we we all we had a sign for who our people were. So when we came upon another another tribe, um, we told them who we were in sign language. And so the sign for my people is actually this, which means people of the waterfall. And when we came upon the French, um, in turn, they called us Grovant, which means big belly in French. So I think when we were trying to tell them we're people of the waterfall, they thought we were saying we had big bellies. I guess that's what we think. Anyway, um, I've been doing this kind of work for decades and I'm super glad that Danny gave us an example of a land acknowledgement, like really acknowledging um, the people whose land that we're on. And I just wanna expand on that a, a little bit because my people come from current day on North Central Montana. And so I am a guest in the traditional homelands of all of those tribes that, that Danny listed, right? Like even though I'm a tribal person, I'm a guest. And I look at the ancestors of all of those tribes that Danny listed as my hosts, like they're, they're my hosts on, on this land. And I'm offering that perspective because for those of you that are tuning in on here, um, you know, are you a guest or are you a host? And we can even take that down into our homes, right? When people come into our homes, we're hosting them as a guest. So we can like act accordingly, right? We can act accordingly as a guest or as a host. So I just wanted to leave that there as some food for thought for you for you to think about. So um, Oregon tribal history, racism and the and the pandemic in the future is is what we're talking about here. Danny gave a great historical context. Um, and all of those things that she talked about are some of those things we term as historical and intergenerational trauma. And the flip side to that is the historical and intergenerational wisdom and resiliency. So yes, the, the hurtful things have been passed down, but so have the good things, right? And when we even look at, um, you know, confronting hate, you know, um, another, way to, another way to look at that is like bringing peace and healing, 
right? Bringing peace and balance. And I think when we look at um, different systems within our society, whether it's education or whether it's business or whether it's social services, et cetera, um, people are finally starting to come around and one, acknowledge that, you know, we as tribal people or indigenous people or native people, one, that we're still here and two, that we may, we may have known like what we were what we were doing before we were labeled as savage and, you know, tried to be, you know, wiped off the face of this earth, because now people are understanding um, the indigenous ways of knowing that that Danny was talking about. And, and, and part of that was living in balance, right, living, living in balance. And so when the pandemic hit, here we are like a year and a half into it. When the pandemic hit, many of us doing this kind of work, we already knew that an already traumatized people would be re-traumatized in this pandemic. And, you know, I, I still have the words of one of my friends. She's an elder, nearly 80 years old. And she, every day when she drove to work, she drove by the, the cemetery where her ancestors that died of the smallpox were buried every day on the way to work and on the way back. And what she realized when COVID hit was she was still holding on to all of this anger, right, towards the federal government because of the intentional infection of smallpox to her people. So her and her two of her friends went to that cemetery and they had their own like letting go ceremony to let go of that anger so she could be present in COVID to protect herself and to protect her family. So so that's one example of how we knew that our people would, would be re-traumatized in this pandemic. And so sure enough, like back in April, we started getting calls and, and texts and emails from people that were really struggling, like even in week two of the pandemic, right? Week two of the shutdown, week two of the quarantine, our people were already struggling. And so like the that historical and intergenerational resiliency that runs in our veins and, and in our bloods, we, we jumped up and we, we took action and we started being solution oriented and seeing what we could do to respond to our community in a good way. And so through our, through our work with Naya and Nara and other partners in the community, we started doing so community support circles for young people, for men, for women, for two-spirit, for parents and, and families. And we've been doing them ever since. We took a break, a little break last summer. I think we're gonna take a little break this summer. Um, but it was just a way to help our people to connect, right? To connect online. We're, we're doing them all on Zoom. You know, we've all become Zoom warriors over this last year. So it was a way to help uplift our people, to help, you know, lend an ear to, um, just to connect in a, in a good way online. And so we've been, we've been doing that through this, through this whole time. So, you know, lots of other things have been happening in this pandemic. And we look at the intersection of the social justice revolution that is going on that Portland has been, you know, such an epicenter with, right. And so that, you know, that layered an, another type of trauma on, on top of the pandemic. Right. And when we look at, you know, what is what is happening here and we we talk about intergenerational trauma, historical and intergenerational trauma on our people. And we look at um, the, the the historical and intergenerational trauma of non tribal people. Right. There, there was even a question in the chat of like, you know, what what do we what do we call you guys? You know, do we say. Native? Do we say Native American? Do we say Indigenous? Um, and I think we're gonna. We'll probably talk about that uh, about that later. You know, and and I I reflect that question back to you. Like, you know, what do white people want to be called? Right. Like right now, I'm saying white people. But what 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 do white people want to be called? And I'm using that as an example because we can always, you know, we can always flip it around as we as we continue to be good human beings on this earth, right? As we continue to try to bring that peace and that balance and that healing. So this country was founded on, on racism. This country was founded in white supremacy and labeling other people as less than, right? 
and white supremacy then contributed to oppression. That was, that's what this country was founded on. And then it was founded on, on fear. Like we had to fear certain kind of people. So when we really go back in our histories, you know, um, there's some healing, there's some healing there to do. Right. And, and the, and the native community, like we, we know that and we're we're doing our healing work and we welcome other people from outside of our community to take a look at your pasts as well and what can you do to contribute to to the healing to help to help bring us together so in the social justice um, revolution that's happening right now you know what can we do you know how can we get involved um where where can we start you know and i always say like we can start we can start with our own selves and there's this you know saying that people often use about you know the longest journey that we'll ever take is from here to here you know our heads to our hearts but the other part of the journey after we go from our head to our heart we have to go back to our head. We have to journey back to our head and the way we think, right? Because the way that we think um, influences the way that we behave. It influences our, our decisions. And so the I wanna just share a few things about the balance piece. So we've had lots of loss in COVID, right? We've, um, some people have lost their jobs. Some people have lost, um, friendships. Some people have lost loved ones, right? That, that loss of life. So there's this great sense of grief that our people are experiencing all across Indian country. COVID has hit Indian country hard. Um, and then we, you know, I'm not even talking about the health disparities and all that. And Natalie's going to talk a little bit more about that. But COVID has hit Indian country hard. We've had lots of loss. We look at our panel members and we can all talk about family and friends and family and friends of colleagues that have passed away from, from COVID. And in that, in that, what we have tried to do is still bring about that balance. So for example, many of our tribal teachings around grief is that wherever you have sorrow, right, you're also going to have joy. Wherever you have sorrow, you are also going to have joy. I was just recently um, at a funeral and I, and I told some, it was actually my children. I told my children, their father passed away. And I said, we're, gonna, we're going into a sorrowful time right now. Sorrow is going to be everywhere. And our job is to also look for the joy because that's what helps to bring balance. And that's what helps us to get through difficult times and challenging times like this. So I leave this here in this panel as well, because those are the tools, like that's a cultural tool that we have that keeps us moving forward, right? And, and some people will say, oh, resiliency is a colonizer's term, but we have it in our language. We have these words in our language. And in, in my language, means don't give up. That, that is our 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 comparison to the English word resiliency, right? We have that in our, in our, in our DNA, our, our elders call that our blood memory, right? To never give up. This is why I, I'm sitting here on this panel today. I descend from miracle survivors of genocide. I'm here as a descendant of miracle survivors of genocide because my people never gave up. Like that's why I'm still here. And I use that as a tool, even in this pandemic, like we are going to get through this and we are going to be okay. We're gonna be more than okay because what this is gonna do is it's going to continue to strengthen us as a people, right? And we're gonna to continue to be that model for others. Like I'm grateful for the people that have chose to come and, and listen in today, right? One, you're seeing contemporary Native people that are still here, that are still using our traditional value systems and our, our traditional tools and protocols to help us live and balance in this life that, that we have today. So I also just wanna leave with a, with a quick story. My people are, are Buffalo people. And um, way back when I was a teenager, before cell phones and all of that kind of stuff, um, we were preparing for one of our tribal gatherings and we were, we were um, 
harvesting two buffalo that we were going to that we were going to butcher and give to all of our all, all of our guests that were coming because they were coming to our lands and we were going to host them. And so one of my uncles was on tribal council at the time and he was in charge of the hunt and he got to choose the hunters and all of this. Anyway, me and my sisters and my cousins, we were just going to watch. We weren't even a part of anything. And so we drove out there in our truck and there's the other hunters were in these two other trucks and the buffalo kept running all over and they were amongst this fence line and they needed like this third truck to come in to help the buffalo stay in one spot. And so pretty soon they start going like this, like waving us all along. And I was the driver. And I told my sisters and cousins, like, look, they, they want us to come and be this third truck and block in these buffalo. And they're like, how do you know they're saying that? <laughs> anyway, so we, we, we went up there. So there was the fence, these two trucks, and we became the third truck right here. And the buffalo would run one way and we would all drive one way. Then the buffalo would turn around. It was like 50 in this herd the buffalo would turn around and I wouldn't have time to turn the truck around. So I would just put it in reverse and I would bomb backwards and then they would turn and go forward. So I kept going forward, backward, forward, backward. And all the while I'm getting closer and closer to the herd. And then finally this, the big bull turned and started charging our truck. And I, I didn't know what to do. Like I kind of like froze and all, all I could think of to do was to honk the horn. So I honked the horn and the buffalo just went, turned and like went right by our it felt like it was right by our door and someone asked me later like why didn't you just drive away and I was just like well, I, I didn't think of it in that moment <laughs> so anyway after after they turned the the first hunter got the shot off shot the buffalo the buffalo dropped and the whole herd stopped and turned around and came back and circled that buffalo and with their horns they picked it back up and they circled it and they ran with it until that buffalo finally fell. And then like four buffalo came and just stood with that buffalo for like two minutes and then they left. So I share that story because, you know, what if we all did that for each other? What if when one of us went down, we all circled each other and lifted each other back up? Regardless of how we identified, right? regardless of what box we check on a, on a form. What if we did that as human beings to each other, right? That would be one tool that we can do in the social justice revolution. That's one tool that we can do to help bring peace and healing to this world that oftentimes seems void of peace and healing. So I just leave that as well as food for thought. And thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And I'm sure we'll be back at the end with questions and answers. Thank you. And I'm gonna pass it off to my amazing friend and colleague, um, Madeline. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here and a blessing to be with you all this morning. Uh, my name is Natalie Bigay. I am a citizen of the Diné Nation. I, um, I always have to say I'm from the New Mexico side of the Diné Nation because um, we're, we're much, we're actually a little different from the Arizona side too. So um, <clears throat> again, I'm, uh, I work at uh, NEA and um, I'm the health equity program manager uh, at the organization and have been there for a little while. And, um, and I'm actually, uh, we were just talking a little bit before this um, panel started about um, our time here that we've been spending in Portland. And, and I'm the newest member of uh, the Portland um, urban Indian community. So uh, I'm coming today to just to tack on um, the end of uh, Jalene and Danny's presentation. Thank you so much, Jalene and, and Danny, for your wonderful words. Uh, Jalene, you got me a little choked up in that, so I'm a hard follow to, <laughs> to your presentation as, um, or your words, and, and it was an, um, very meaningful to me. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit today about um, some of the background um, of our work here in the community. Uh, I, my background is actually in public health um, and I came uh, into the work and, um, and I, I feel like it's um, a very a, a, a close ties to you know, our traditional values as native people. Um, I came into, I actually started my um, 
I knew I was going to go to college. I just didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and getting into college, I wanted to be in the health field, but I wasn't quite sure of um, what. So I actually struggled in my first year of, of where uh, finding my grounding. Um, but eventually I, um, I reached out and I found uh, a program that was based in complementary and alternative medicine. Um, and when it was supposed to be a pre-med program for those who are going into um, for DOs or um, <clears throat> other um, CAM uh, modalities. So I started that program and there was a, a lot of, there was, I mean, it's just a, a, a lot of connection to our, our values. Um, and Julene touched on them about holistic health and just finding that balance in my, um, in, in my Navajo, um, in my Diné values. Um, and, and most tribal values, we, we look at harmony as really finding that balance in your life um, in all areas and not just in, you know, your physical health, but in your emotional, spiritual your context. Um, so there's, there was a lot of that um, shared values in that. And it, and it actually transferred to um, by post graduate and looking into graduate programs. And, and I decided to stay in the public health field because of that, um, the community connection. As I got more into the work of public health, I was working in tribal programs and um, there was just a lot of connections to that. Um, and one of them being uh, putting your community first. And um, it's been, I, I've been in the public health field for almost about 13 years. And um, I've done a lot of work in the tribal communities, not in the urban setting. And this is my first urban um, experience. And it's been, it's been amazing and um, a, a learning journey for me. And part of that, uh, resiliency that Jolene was talking about, and most of the resiliency is, is coming from our community. Um, one of, you know, as Native people, we don't focus on the individual, and and it's not about me, it's about my community and putting community first. And our work that we have been doing um, in collaboration has been, uh, it, it's thriving because of our partnerships and our, our focus on the community. Uh, Jolene mentioned that we do have, um, that we have our, the work of the pandemic has been um, focused on addressing and just taking care of our community during this time, lifting each other up. And um, one of those things, one, some of the work that we've been doing has been um, focused on, on reaching out to our families and, um, and not just getting them, you know, basic needs like, um, tissue and um, hand sanitizer uh, or rent uh, paid, but also meeting their cultural needs and, and really looking at the whole person. So we've been um, delivering to our families in the urban areas and the tri-county areas, um, salmon. We've done a lot of traditional food deliveries. We also have been um, sending out um, arts and crafts um, for the family cultural items um, and healing items. We've, we've done a lot of gathering, um, nettle and cottonwood and really purposeful in meeting those holistic needs of our community during this time. Um, one of the, the hardships of living um, in the urban area and it's just the access to healthcare. Um, we have as native people, um, Danny mentioned um, the policies that are in place and, and she focused on um, education, uh, but there also is um, healthcare issues. And part of those policies in healthcare, um, one of the myths that uh, many people have is native people have free healthcare. Um, and that is definitely um, not true. <laughs> and it depends on the region that you are in. Um, in the Northwest, there are, um, actually very limited clinics that uh, community members can access. Um, NARA is one. Um, however, the, there's, um, the closest hospital is um, hundreds of miles away and Native people in the urban area just <clears throat> have limited access to those treaty right um, healthcare options. And even when they do have access to it, um, it is um, the Indian Health Service is also very, um, is only funded by 40% um, 
um, of their needs. And so many of the organizations, uh, many of the urban uh, health centers also actually are funded less than that too. So they have to make up their funding amounts through grants and um, other federal funding. And they really work hard at getting that, um, getting their, their funding for their organizations so that they can um, provide healthcare to the urban areas. Um, NARA does an amazing job at that and has been an establishment in the Portland area for, for many years. And they have a very robust um, uh, services, although um, there's definitely needs as the Portland um, urban area, the Portland urban native community um, continues to thrive and grow. So um, part of our work here at, at NEA in partnership with NWI and NARA and the county is really um, being that resource for those, um, those the, the urban Indian, there's a lot of growth and, and moving to the urban areas, um, primarily because, because of opportunities um, back in our tribal communities, the, the jobs are limited, uh, resources are limited. And so native people, um, sometimes we don't want to leave um, our communities, but sometimes for the, the sake of our families and, and the well-being of our families, we have to leave and come to urban areas and uh, to find jobs and resources that we need, including healthcare resources, um, because there's rural, most of the communities are, um, a lot of the communities are in rural areas. And, um, and again, this goes back to tribal policy about um, placements, um, you know, some of we try and keep our language resilient to communities uh, versus reservations. Um, but because we try, even in our in those reservations, we are trying to thrive and and we are thriving. Um, but they all are so um, sometimes inaccessible and areas that we um, so that some tribal communities cannot grow um, foods or really find that um, enterprise to thrive on. So, um, again, and that leads to that um, population, the um, increased population for the, the urban areas. So um, I'm really honored to be um, part of that, um, part of the team that collaborates to, to meet the needs of our indigenous people here in, in the community. Um, one of the questions, and, and we're going to go into our Q&As, and I'm really excited about it, um, to answer some of the questions that are in the in the um, chat, because oh, there's a lot. There was a question about terms, and, and Jolene had mentioned that. But there are um, many of our community members here in in the area are um, multiracial. We're um, we identify strongly with our tribal roots, and we actually love to be called our our tribal our tribal names. Um, and are not our, um, the names that were placed on. Uh, for instance, my, my um, colonized name uh, for our tribal people is the Navajo people, um, but Diné is actually a, our, our identifying term for ourselves. Um, so in our language, so it just meets the people. And um, so there was some, so I think we can turn to a little bit of the Q and A's, but I just, um, primarily wanted to highlight the, um, just the really amazing partnerships that we have with all of the urban organizations in the Portland area. Um, Jillian uses a really great term about um, the opposite of, and please jump in Jillian if I wish you this, but the opposite of um, competition is collaboration. And that, and that is exactly what we're doing. So I, um, even in our work at, during the pandemic, you know, um, Naya doesn't do the work. It's, do the work. We do it in partnership with our with the all the other organizations. And sometimes that's hard for folks to understand um, because they want to place us in in an organization box and say, "Well, Naya is doing the work," and we have to continuously say, "No, we are doing it as a collaborative effort." With um, you know, and, and then it turns out, well, who is in the collaboration? All of us. <laughs> and, um, you know, sometimes we do have to say, identify um, Jolene and, and Native Wellness Institute and 
um, all of the other great partners that we have in the community, but we all work together to meet those needs. We are very resourceful and we're, we're here and uh, we want to be seen and continue to, um, you know, take care of our community and let others know that, you know, we are continuing to thrive and, um, and we do that with, um, with each other and with the support of, of all those, not just on this panel, but all the amazing um, family and friends that we have in the community and you all as well too. So thank you so much for your time and I'm excited to go into this Q&A. Thank you, Natalyn, and thank you, panel members. Uh, we do have several questions before I get to them. I just wanted to explain a few of the acronyms. Uh, NAYA, N-A-Y-A, is the acronym we use for the Native American Youth and Family Center, which is where Natalyn and I work. And the other one is NARA, N-A-R-A, which stands for the Native American Rehabilitation Association, who are also delivering fantastic benefits to the uh, Native community. Um, I'm gonna go back to, um, this is from a question uh, about, it says, um, what's the correct terminology to use? Is it Native American, Native American community, uh, Indian, tribal, indigenous, and, I think even though you touched on it, Jolene, I think it's important to bring up because you and I and Sasha uh, were on a campaign this past year uh, for the Winterhawks Hockey League to change their racist logo and they finally are. And he asked the same question. And then afterwards in a private conversation, just the two of us, he said they were so nervous about offending us with the terminology that they just avoided us. So um, can one of you um, talk about this a little bit more because it's a, it's a real, it's a real interest, and in, and I think there's real fear about offending us, and so people avoid us in order to avoid offending us. I I I think um, I can answer a little part of this, um, and I'm excited for this question because I'm actually um, I still do work research work for the University of North Dakota, um, and part of our research study that we've been looking at for the past two years is um, identifying terms for. Uh, Native people in health research. Um, and so this is more, this is um, just looking at some of our outcomes. We, we, it's turned into two years of research because of the conversations and amazing outcomes that, has, that have come from it. We've looked at decades, um, you know, going back into the 60s all the way up to present day. And everyone is just very confused. Um, the term American Indian is something that was imposed on us. That it's an umbrella term. Um, we are very unique people. Um, there are over uh, 574 tribes now um, that are recognized and many others that are unrecognized. And each, like Jolene said, have uh, unique languages, customs, and we're not all the same. And, and yet we get umbrellaed into um, American Indian, which is the term the government uses. Um, OMB uses that, um, and the census uses uh, American Indian. Uh, Native American is also another term that's used, um, and there's different contexts too with that. It's another umbrella term, um, and there's indigenous. Um, some in some places in federal work, we can't use indigenous because it doesn't. It actually the term um, doesn't give us treaty rights. And so in legal terms, we can't use indigenous, even though many of us love the term indigenous. And um, I actually prefer that term versus any other, but I actually, the preference is asking, getting the, um, not, not, not facing that fear and asking the people that you are speaking with about the term they, they um, prefer. And that is gonna be that the best and most honorable, um, um, respectful way is to ask them what term they on to. Many of us, as you can see in our, even our identifiers, we use native, we use um, indigenous and, and we're able to do that, um, but definitely check in. Um, don't be afraid, check in with those who you're speaking to and ask them what term they prefer for you to use because we also vary in our in our terms we choose. Yeah, I love that answer, Nadlin. Thank you. And also, um, you know, 
don't worry about offending people because we can't offend people without their permission. And one time somebody told me, I said something and they go, well, you offended me. And I said, well, don't let me, don't let me offend you. <laughs> like it can be that simple. Um, so, and I say that because like, don't be afraid to call us native American or American Indian or native, like, like Madeline just said, you know, ask us. And it, there's, it, it also follows the, the, um, a timeline, right? like indigenous is kind of one of the latest terms that people are using to, to describe us, right? Um, there was a time when it was Native American. There was a time when it was just Indian. Um, and we, like for my organization, we use Native, Native Wellness Institute. And um, we're just trying to be, you know, inclusive of Alaska Natives and, you know, the, just to be more inclusive. So um, this is why relationship building is so important, right? why friendship building is so important. So we can have these conversations without worrying about tiptoeing around and am I gonna hurt someone's feelings or am I gonna offend someone or whatever? So yeah, just talk to us and ask. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what I told uh, the Winterhawks president was, I'm not gonna be offended. You just have to start using a term and if I don't like it, I'll let you know, but don't worry about it. Yeah. If somebody, is that picky, they're probably gonna be picking at you for other things too. So just don't worry about it. Um, yes. And he, he laughed and said, okay. And it actually kind of liked the whole conversation after that. Um, this next question um, is, uh, is PPS, Portland Public Schools, uh, a leader in moving education forward for native students? So I think this is a question for you, Danny. Great. Well, I would say that we certainly aspire to be a leader, um, but I, I want to make sure that we're really clear that we want to do it in partnership with the community. I think uh, the, the focus of our superintendent and certainly of my office is to make sure that we're, um, that we're really sort of thinking differently about how we do partnership. Um, folks who are furthest away from educational justice are not just uh, uh, sort of at the table, but really sort of thought partners and decision makers. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do with our partners and with our within our own district is to try to understand directly from students, directly from families and direct, directly from community leaders about what is it that we can do to, to really support the needs for, for every student, particularly our Native students and our Black students. So we are um, really focused on that. I think um, when I look across the country and I think about the large urban school districts, we're the largest school district in uh, Oregon, and we're the only school district in the country that really calls out the importance of our racial equity work in centering around Native and Black students. Um, that being said, I think that we are starting to get all of the ingredients, uh, getting better ingredients. Um, I'm really proud of our partnership with NAIA Family Center. We partner with NAIA in a variety of ways. Um, as you know, NEA has the Many Nations Academy, uh, where they have a school where students are uh, really just wrapped around with all the love and support, the cultural traditions, as well as uh, a very fine uh, academic education, right? That's really centered in indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and the uh, graduation rates from the Many Nations Academy are, are superior to any place in the state. Um, and so we really are proud of that partnership that we have there. Um, we also get to partner with NEA uh, with their youth support activities. So we uh, partner with them to do positive cultural um, identity development for middle schoolers and for high school students. Uh, we also partner with them around um, uh, wraparound services and community, culturally specific community engagement. They're working with parents uh, to uh, really help navigate and really feel a sense of agency and empowerment in our school system. Um, I'm really proud that on Tuesday, 
uh, the fabulous Tamara Henderson and Daniel Guilfoyle, uh, two amazing NAIA leaders, um, shared a lot of the work that they were doing uh, with over spring break with uh, the entire superintendent's cabinet. Um, there were a hundred people at this meeting with other partners um, and they were talking about their spring activities and it was really clear that um, all the sort of like research, academic, like education sort of benchmarks were being met. But the whole room, if you imagine the Zoom room was transfixed with uh, the pictures of students who were learning about um, lampreys and learning how to prepare them in a delicious way. Uh, and there were these amazing pictures and folks were able to understand and really sort of get a sense of not only are students getting uh, a, an amazing scientific and uh, enrichment to their education, but it's so deeply rooted in cultural traditions where their identities are being affirmed and um, their, their assets are, are being, being fully brought to the table. Um, and uh, I think about those students and their experience, whether it's at the, uh, at the Many Nations Academy or at one of our you know, over 100 schools at PPS, and I think about a student who has that sort of um, profound experience uh, done in learning and joy where their assets are being celebrated are gonna be much better prepared to succeed than if we're not providing those. So I, I think we're getting the ingredients right. Um, and I think that over, over dedicated time, we're finding that at PPS, our strategies are working. We're seeing more success for students, students of color, because of the focus uh, on, on students of color and understanding the structural and cultural racism that, that embeds in the system. Uh, because of the history, but it's it's the understanding of those community cultural assets, uh, the partnerships, the um, thought partnership that can help us uh, sort of get to the to the next level. Great, thank you, Danny. Um, this next um, is not a it's not a question; it's actually a comment. So I'm just going to read it. Um, I'm so struck by the similarities of the native people and the Jews and how people have tried to wipe us out and the generational trauma that has caused. I'm sad I hadn't considered this before. This is a great discussion and I hope all of our communities, all communities can come together to support each other, to heal and to bring change for the better around us. Thank you. It's that well said. And you know, I also represent in the LGBTQ community and in the 80s and 90s, uh, we were under attack. And one of the first communities to step forward in our support was the Jewish community. So I, I do think there's a lot of shared values and shared history with many communities. And I uh, wanna again, thank the, uh, the Jewish Federation of Portland for hosting this conference. Um, this next uh, question, I think is gonna be directed to you, Natalyn. Are people in your communities getting access to the COVID vaccine and are they receptive to it? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Um, it, it's a little, um, yes, they are. Actually, uh, I wanna highlight just the amazing work that tribes do in their um, own communities. They were actually one of, um, because of the unique relationship we have with the federal government, um, they actually were given the vaccines first before the state distributed. And, and because of their work, they were able to vaccinate their tribal uh, people in their communities, um, one of the first in the state. So uh, much, um, much applause to those tribes in, in Oregon and all over the U.S. that were able to vaccinate. Um, and many of them have actually high rates of vaccinations. Um, and my, for instance, my, my tribe has um, over almost a 70% vaccination rate with our community. Um, here in the urban area, so we do have access um, in several ways uh, to the vaccination and we have been very active um, in our collaboration with the Future Generations Collaborative uh, work together to get our uh, Native community in uh, to be vaccinated. So we're really happy uh, that those that have uh, wanted the vaccine have been vaccinated. Uh, we have great partnerships with Multnomah County. Um, and the OHA, and so they've been really um, helpful in that. Um, but we also are hitting, um, just like everyone else, hitting a low and really working hard to, um, uh, to um, answer questions, um, address and, and um, help build the confidence in the vaccine right now. So 
our work has shifted a little um, from um, getting folks into vaccine clinics to really having meaningful discussions with them um, and meeting those cultural needs too. I think we have some upcoming, um, we have some different strategies um, to help build that confidence in the vaccine and, and Jeline and our group is really um, looking at more of a cultural approach and um, smaller vaccine events um, and really uh, putting our um, efforts into those meaningful conversations. Yeah, and if I can well, just- thank you. Uh, oh. I just wanna point out that we have uh, less than one minute left. <laughs> uh, do you wanna say something quickly, Julian, then we'll have to close. Yeah, just quickly. Um, we had an elder that shared his story about the vaccine and he talked about the things that he was doing to protect himself spiritually and the things that he needed to do to protect himself physically, one of which was getting the vaccine. And he talked about our people as, you know, we were some of the first scientists, right? And because we were studying the, we were studying the great spirit, the creator, which is in, which is in each of us. And so I just wanted to share that as well. We can always rely on our cultural values to help guide us in our behaviors today to protect ourselves and our, and our people. There were so many questions that came up in the chat. There's unfortunately not enough time to address them all. I do wanna thank all the panelists for your uh, presentations and your responses to the question. You've all been fantastic. And once again, thank you to the Greater Federation of uh, Jewish Federation of Portland. Thank you again. And you all have a great day, okay? Thank you. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you again, panel. I'm gonna go ahead and log out. I will coordinate with Sasha on some of these other questions and see if we can get a response back. One of them was directed to you, Jolene, so we'll forward that to you. Okay, awesome. Thanks okay. again for the invite. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Danny. Nice to meet you. <laughs>